Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Ultrasensitive Immunoassays for Translation of Biomarkers from Discovery to the Clinic. Two of the most important areas of focus in current biotech research are biomarkers and translational medicine. What's more, these two topics are intimately tied to each other. Scientists increasingly rely on biomarker screening, discovery, and identification for disease characterization and drug development. The goal is to use this information to take research findings from the laboratory into the clinic, a process known as translational medicine. Today's webinar will focus on the description and applications of a new technology platform designed to translate biomarkers quickly and efficiently from discovery to the clinic. Let's meet our webinar panelists. Dr. Corinne Solier is group head, clinical protein biomarkers at Roche. She will discuss the use of antibody-based assays for the identification of circulating protein biomarkers in the clinic. Dr. Stacy House is clinical instructor in emergency medicine at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Stacy will describe the performance of a high sensitivity cardiac troponin I assay in emergency department, because that's where patients are evaluated for acute coronary syndrome. Dr. Lynn Ziske, Vice President of Commercial Solutions at Singulex, will provide a roadmap for bringing a disease biomarker to the clinic using a novel and innovative immunoassay system. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as moderator. Please feel free to enlarge the slide images or download the complete presentation. At any time during the webinar, you can send in a question for our panelists. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible during the question and answer segment that takes place after all the presentations have been made. Now, if everyone's ready, let's get going. Dr. Corrine Solier will be our lead-off presenter. Corrine? Thank you, John. Today I will talk about antibody-based uh, assays for the identification of circulating protein biomarkers in the clinic. Specifically, I will present technological features of the, some of the platform and will speak about the methodological challenges. My talk will be organized into four sections. First, I will talk about the need for personalized health care and explain how biomarkers integrate into this need. Then I will speak about fit for purpose validation of a biomarker and an associated assay. Um, next, I will present the opportunity represented by multiplex immunoassays as well as popular formats, and I will highlight some of the main challenges that we can encounter with such platforms. And finally, I will speak about emerging te technology in the immunoassay area that can help uh, come to the next step, and uh, in particular in the field of high sensitivity. We all know that personalized health care is essential to provide better tailored medicine to patients. And in that context, biomarkers play a major role because they improve decision making, they help understand pathways and mechanisms, and uh, mostly they are the drivers for pharmacodiagnostic development. Now I will talk about fit for purpose uh, validation. And we can see on that slide the four main phases of a biomarker development. Uh, typically, we start with the identification of candidate biomarker in a discovery approach. Then we develop specific assays for these candidates, and we technically validate these assays. Then we use these assays to demonstrate the biomarker clinical utility and finally, we consider biomarker valid uh, when it's included in routine clinical practice and when it is continually assessed in this context. As you can see on the second box of this arrow, during this biomarker development, the uh, development of uh, a well-suited assay as well as its technical validation is absolutely essential to validate a biomarker in the clinic. 
uh, the next slide, you can see um, how the, bio, the technical assay validations can be tailored according to the biomarker uh, requirements. On the left-hand side, you can see that uh, when biomarker data are intended to be used for only exploratory purposes, meaning that they will not be included into any official clinical study report, nor will be submitted to authorities, uh, we need a basic type of validation that we can call discovery grade. Uh, however, when uh, the biomarker data are part of the clinical study report, as is normally the case for pharmacodynamic biomarkers, for instance, uh, and where they are subjected to be submitted to authorities, but still will not be used as a basis for any medical decision, we need to apply a more stringent type of validation that is uh, commonly called GCLP or GLP-like uh, or research type of validation. And finally, on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, an in vitro diagnostic type of validation is necessary when a biomarker result will be used for taking medical decision. But I will not speak about this type of validation, which belongs to another uh, field of, uh, of the business. You can see on the, this cartoon how a typical assay validation can be articulated. There are ma three main phases. In the first phase, called also feasibility assessment, we typically um, resort to a few commercial kits or an in-house developed assays, and we compare the basic performance of these assays uh, in order to select the best suited kit for our purpose. When this is done and when we have also an assessment of the endogenous levels in um, a suitable cohort that will mimic uh, the future clinical samples that we want to measure, then we apply a full assay validation which is tailored according to the need, as I explained on the previous slide, so either a discovery type of validation or more a GCLP-like type of validation. Last but not least, it is extremely important to bridge the different lots of uh, assays that are used across different studies, um, in particular to bridge the performance in terms of uh, limits of quantifications and dynamic range in order to be able to compare the data obtained with different kit lots. I will now speak about multiplex amino assays, especially because uh, these platforms have uh, been extensively used in the clinic, uh, and the reason is uh, because they provide a simple, fast, simple and cost-effective way to discover biomarkers and to translate them into the clinic. Um, and we can see the main, that the use or the potential applications of these multiplex amino assays are quite broad, going from uh, risk assessment biomarkers markers down to uh, therapy monitoring. You can see on this slide the two main formats of multiplex immunoassays. On the left-hand side, we have the planner immunoassays on which uh, capture antibodies specific for different antigens are spotted onto discrete locations of a solid phase surface. And on the right-hand side, we have the bit suspension-based immunoassays. In this format, um, color and size-coded beads are um, coated with the capture antibody specific for each antigen, and the detection is ensured using a flow cytometry uh, technology. I would like now uh, to illustrate some of the challenges that uh, the analyst is facing when using multiplexed immunoassays, although they have been extremely useful um, so far in biomarker research. I took an, a personal example that we have uh, carried out last year in our lab, and we measured 93 sputum asthmatic samples using uh, the Roosevelt Medicine um, Luminex inflammation pack, uh, map containing 47 biomarkers. And uh, uh, we received uh, the results and noticed uh, that two values for the sensitivity limits were provided, the limit of detection, or LOD, and an LLOQ, which is the lower limit of quantification of the assay. The LOD corresponds to uh, the background level detected by the assay and the detection systems and is measured uh, with uh, several replicates of buffer and uh, adding to the mean value two or three standard deviations of the blank. 
on the in on the other hand, we also can determine the lower limit of quantification, which corresponds to the functional sensitivity sensitivity limit of the assay. That means that the LLOQ represents the lower concentrations that an assay can detect with good precision and good accuracy in a specific matrix. As you can see in the circle, in the red circle, we uh, were surprised to see that for 11% of the marker, uh, the LLOQ value was inferior to the LOD, which was uh, inconsistent or incoherent. And when we discussed this issue uh, with rules-based medicine, we identified that uh, the way they determined the lower limit of quantification could explain this discrepancy because this was assessed in buffer, not in the intended matrix, and only taking into account precision criteria and not uh, recovery or accuracy criteria. Since then, rules-based medicine have adapted their measurement of the LLOQ, um, and this can be now uh, found on their websites. On the right panel of the table, you can see that another issue is sensitivity. As you can see, about 40% of the marker reported only 50% or less values for these 93 samples. And I would like to summarize uh, on the next slide the main challenges that we face using um, multiplex platforms. As I said, sensitivity, and this is mainly due to the need to use a common assay format for all the markers from a panel, uh, leading to the use of a compromised protocol instead of an optimized protocol. Robustness can also sometimes be seen, in particular for bead-based assays, as it was reported that bead manufacturing uh, issues could account uh, for up to 30% of uh, an result variability. Uh, also very common are um, problems of specificity or selectivity, which are due to potential cross-reactivities between the different detection antibodies and capture antibodies from uh, large panels. And finally, Although we have a clear guidance issued by the FDA to validate monoplex immunoassays, we clearly lack similar guidance to validate multiplex immunoassays, which are much more challenging methods to, to validate. Um, I would like now to speak about emerging technologies in the immunoassay field, which we have been interested in, my group. And in that context, I would like to explain what uh, uh, Roche Pharma is looking for in terms of biomarker discovery platforms. So we're looking for high sensitivity platforms in order to be able to measure the low abundant uh, proteins in various matrices, such as the cytokines, which are, can be encountered in the low uh, picogram or even sub-picogram per milliliter range. We also would like to have a flexible platform that allows um, in-house and custom assay development from the end user. And of course, we would like to minimize sample volume consumption in order to be able to measure as many markers as possible with minimal uh, volume availabilities, especially from uh, rodents. And in that uh, respect, Singulex has been a platform of interest for us. The Singulex platform has been described to improve the sensitivity uh, of uh, singleplex immunoassays by up to three orders of magnitude. This is mainly driven by the use of paramagnetic microparticle beads as the solid phase surface to capture uh, antibodies, and also by um, a specific digital counting system that counts uh, single fluorescent events emitted by the, the detection antibodies and uh, this allows to uh, exclude background values. Uh, Singulex has been successfully applied, as described in the literature, for the measurement of critically low abundant analytes, such as VGF, cardiac troponin I, and IL-13. Uh, we were interested in this platform when we had the question to measure IL-17A in human serum and plasma. And when we reviewed the literature, we found that many commercial kits were available, but there were inconsistent results across uh, the different publications, and that 
these results depended very much on the kits that was used to measure IL-17A and serum in plasma. And the levels were reported to be as low as uh, undetectable and as high as 500 picogram per milliliter in one report in rheumatoid arthritis uh, serum. I would, here I pasted a cartoon from an interesting publication, uh, and in this publication the investigators made the same remark that the literature was rich of inconsistent data, so they decided to develop their own assay to measure IL-17A. And you can see on the left-hand side of the cartoon that they were able to measure uh, levels between zero and up to a thousand picogram per milliliters in um, samples from osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis patients. And um, they were quite happy about these results, but decided to further optimize their assay by adding a blocking uh, agent in order to rule out any possible interference from common interfering factors, including in particular the rheumatoid factors that are present in um, serum and plasma from rheumatoid arthritis patients. And as you can see on the right-hand side, this um, optimization le led to a complete extinction of the signal. And this was very disappointing because this result indicated that they were actually measuring uh, false positive uh, in the absence of any blocking agent. So altogether, these data were uh, indicating that we were uh, in need of a robust and validated method to measure IL-17A, which is why we decided to validate the singular XIL-17A assay in serum and plasma. On the left-hand side, we conducted a dilution linearity experiment, which gave excellent results down to a dilution of 1 to 256. And you can see in the, on the, in the bottom part that the recovery was well between 80% and 120% for, um, across this uh, whole range. On the right-hand side, you can see an almost perfect superimposition of uh, the standard curves prepared in buffer in orange, and uh, in plasma matrix in blue, which indicates a lack of uh, major matrix effects. We further uh, investigated the uh, batch-to-batch or run-to-run -run reproducibility. On the left-hand side, you can see typical experiment comparing uh, the results obtained for 10 um, normal subjects across two different uh, runs conducted on two different days, and you can see uh, a very good correlation of the results. Um, and I would like to draw your attention on the very low values that are uh, well below 0.8 picogram per milliliter. We wanted also to assess whether these assays were interfered by rheumatoid factors. And, uh, and to this end, we measured samples on the right-hand side from rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, we took 15 of these samples, including, as indicated by the stars, samples containing very high rheumatoid factor titers. And as you can see, there is no interference from rheumatoid factors because the values obtained in these samples were very similar to those obtained in normal subjects on the left side. And uh, you can see that typically the values are below 0.3 picogram per milliliter. On the bottom right, you can see as well that the performance of this assay uh, is equally good in serum and plasma in a panel of 10 uh, matched serum and plasma samples from 10 different donors. We considered, based on these results and additional ones not shown here, that uh, the assay was technically validated and that we could use it to measure clinical samples. And uh, we used this assay in a clinical trial, which I will keep confidential, to measure IL-17A. And here you can see the results obtained in three different treatment groups. Um, and in red are the placebo-treated uh, subjects, in black the the, the drug-treated subjects, and you can very clearly see that we have um, a dose-dependent and time-dependent uh, correlation uh, left for the concentrations of IL-17A measured in these subjects. Um, and uh, these data were very important for us because they allowed us to establish the clinical utility of the Singulex uh, assay. 
I will now speak about another uh, novel platform which we are currently interested in. This is the Cyvec uh, automated platform. So the principle is rather simple. It is based on an automated, fully automated process and uses a cartridge uh, that is fully manufactured uh, by uh, the Cyvec company. And uh, samples are simply applied to the cartridge and results are obtained between 10 uh, minutes and up to one hour, depending on the concentration uh, of the marker. Uh, we were interested by this technology because it resorts to uh, glass nano reactors, which are uh, basically fiber optics, which are well known to be uh, very robustly manufactured. Therefore, we were uh, thinking that this could lead to extremely good robustness. On the next slide, you have uh, a more detailed view on the fluidic uh, architecture of one cartridge. So uh, this system allows the measurement of monoplex uh, immunoassays in different channels. So here you can see four different channels uh, that can measure in a, a normal sandwich uh, type immunoassays four different markers from the same droplet of sample. You can see in each of the channel four dots which correspond to four replicates. So four glass nano reactors for four uh, replicates included in the channel. The volume requirements are now uh, 20 microliters, but are uh, expected to go down very soon to 10 microliters. And I would like to draw your attention that contrary to the typical multiplex immunoassays here, we have parallel singleplex immunoassays, therefore avoiding uh, the potential cross-reactivities that could occur in multiplex immunoassays. We then wanted to um, evaluate uh, further the repeatability, linearity, matrix effects, and sensitivity of this platform. To this end, we created a panel of samples spiked with different concentrations of uh, different markers of interest that were available on the, on the platform, and we created three replicates of those. So we created a matrix here uh, based on the latent square design. We randomized the samples and we sent them to Cyvec for blind measurements. And uh, you can see on this slide a typical uh, result that we obtained for the, IL the IL-5 assay. So on the, the bottom left-hand side, you can see the correlation between the measured concentration on the y-axis and uh, the spiked concentration on the x-axis. And you can see very good correlation. And you can see that the replicates are also very close. Uh, the other boxes represent uh, linear views of the same correlation, and you will have on the bottom panel some blow-ups on uh, the lower part of the standard curve that allow to see that uh, the limit of quantification is probably somewhere between 10 and uh, 30 picograms per milliliters. Um, I would like to draw your attention as well on the samples that are boxed in light pink. He, these samples are uh, rheumatoid arthritis samples that uh, contain very high rheumatoid factor titers. So in case the assay would be interfered by rheumatoid factors, we would see that these samples would deviate from the linear correlation uh, or regression curve, which is not the case, indicating that this assay is specific and not interfered by uh, uh, rheumatoid factors. We obtained um, similar results for TNF-alpha, except that here in this case, I would like to highlight uh, again the uh, light pink box samples, which in this case deviate from uh, the regression curve. And uh, this means that here in this case, rheumatoid factors interfere with the assay. Um, however, since these assays have not been um, subjected to uh, extensive optimization at Cyvec, uh, we believe that uh, this, this uh, problem uh, is potentially fixable, uh, especially because TNF-alpha is a well known for being a very difficult assay to, uh, to implement. So this data, uh, very encouraging, um, 
prompted us to conclude on uh, good robustness, repeatability, and linearity of the civic platform. We now uh, want to answer uh, the question of the flexibility of this platform uh, for asset transfer from uh, microtato pay to Cyvec and vice versa, for example, because as the biomarker is validated in the clinic, we need to have this flexibility to uh, evolve uh, the assay. Uh, and we are in the process of transferring two assays from microtito plate to Cyvec and two assays from Cyvec to microtito plates. I would like to finish by concluding uh, that uh, Fit for purpose assay validation is critical for the introduction of a new biomarker in the clinic. It is very much so for uh, multiplex immunoassays. However, we need uh, formal performance guidelines on how to best validate these uh, difficult uh, assays. Uh, we believe as well that there is potential in using high sensitivity singleplex platforms as an alternative to multiplex platform in order to be able to measure multiple samples in parallel from the same uh, limited amount of sample using uh, an optimized protocol for each marker. Um, and we have also shown that the SingleX platform uh, provided uh, valid results and uh, has been validated in a, a clinical trial here at Roche. And we are also looking um, at other platforms which uh, have given different levels of performance in our hands. And I would like to finish by thanking uh, my colleagues uh, at Roche as well as our partners uh, at uh, Cyvec. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, back to you, John. Corinne, thank you for that very detailed presentation. Uh, I think bringing in the concept of personalized medicine very early in your talk, that went a long way towards reinforcing the idea about the importance of biomarkers for translational medicine, and that's important because that's the theme of our webinar. If you're just now joining our webinar, welcome. As I mentioned er earlier, we'll be conducting a Q&A segment following the panelists' presentations. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the low left of your console and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Dr. Stacy House, will now begin her presentation. Stacy? Okay, thank you, John. So I'm in emergency medicine at Washington University. Um, in St. Louis, and I'm going to be speaking about the role of a high sensitivity troponin marker in patients that are being ruled out for acute coronary syndromes. So chest pain is a major problem in emergency departments nationwide. It's the fourth most common presenting chief complaint, resulting in 8 million ED visits per year with a chief complaint of chest pain. Um, and because of the way that we have to determine if a patient is actually having an acute coronary syndrome, about a fifth of those patients being, end up being admitted for additional testing and sometimes for treatment. And because of the length of time that this process takes, a lot of emergency departments are utilizing observation units to be able to do serial cardiac biomarker testing and stress testing. So how do we define myocardial infarction? Uh, the latest updates are from 2012 from a consensus group, including the American Cartage College of Cardiology, the AHA, the European Society of Cardiology, and the World Heart Federation Task Force. And the definition for MI includes a rise or fall of a cardiac biomarker, and currently that's preferably a troponin with at least one value that's greater than the 99th percentile in the normal healthy referenced population. And that's combined with... Um, a patients that have symptoms of ischemia or ECG changes like ST changes, a new left bundle branch block, or pathologic Q waves. Or additionally, you could have imaging evidence of a new loss of myocardium or regional wall motion abnormality. And further, they recommend that the 99th percentile upper limit of normal for the biomarker assay really should be defined at less than 10% coefficient of variance. And that's been the major problem for the currently clinically available troponin assays is this um, high uh, sensitivity with such a low coefficient of variance. So because of those characteristics of the assay, we typically do biomarker assessment on presentation and six to nine hours later. And then as well, patients with a really high suspicion of possible acute coronary syndrome um, with high risk stratification, for example, they often have to have additional samples that are done 12 to 24 hours after presentation. So those patients are typically admitted to the hospital. 
So the idea here is that we, if we had assays with improved sensitivity for troponin detection, the possibility is that that could re result in more rapid rule out of myocardial injury, and that could potentially decrease hospital admissions, reduce emergency department or OBS unit usage, and that could contribute to reduction in emergency department overcrowding, which is a growing problem across the country. And then to a lesser extent, there's also the possibility that earlier detection of injury could result in us being able to initiate treatments earlier for those patients. So a little background about the high sensitivity troponin assay from Singulex that was used in this study. A study by Apple in 2010 looked at determining the levels of troponin in a healthy adult population, and they studied 348 um, adults. And we're able to detect troponin I and all of those uh, well, actually not patients, healthy adults, and determined that the 99th percentile value with a less than 10% coefficient of variance was 10.19 nanograms per liter. Also, there was a study by Sabatine in 2009 that looked at patients who were receiving stress testing to determine if they had cardiac ischemia and looked at the ability of the single X assay to detect troponin in those patients. So 120 patients were included, and they measured troponin at baseline immediately after the stress test and then a few hours later. Um, and they were actually able to uh, detect troponin in all of the baseline samples, so it confirmed um, what had been done in the other studies showing uh, that it could be detected in a healthy population. And they were also able to show that patients who had mild ischemia on their stress test had a 24% increase in the troponin that was able to be detected, and patients with moderate to severe ischemia had a 40% increase in troponin concentration. So this is showing that they're detecting that very subtle elevation in troponin that's uh, resulting uh, because of the small amount of ischemia during stress testing. So we wanted to look at the performance of this assay in emergency department patients who are symptomatic and being ruled out for acute coronary syndromes. So we, in order to enroll patients, our recruitment tool was utilizing our computer-assisted subject enrollment in the emergency department database. It's a database of all our ED electronic medical record data, and it's updated and screened every 15 minutes. So that allows us to be looking for patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this uh, database works such that if we um, set triggers for patients that can be included in the study, it will send us either pages or email notifications when a patient is in the emergency department. So the triggers we chose for this study was all patients who had a clinical troponin ordered, as well as having to have a chief complaint that of something that could be indicative of cardiac ischemia. So we chose chest pain, heartbeat, rapid or irregular, painful chest, palpitations, rapid heartbeat, or uh, syncope. And because of this, we did a consecutive sample of all our emergency department patients in a three-month period from November 1st of 2011 to January 31st of 2012 who are being evaluated for ACS. So once we received email notification that the patients had been in the emergency department, we did an electronic medical record review, and we included all those patients who either had an initial positive so patients who were found to have MI on their first biomarker assay, as well as patients who were being ruled out for ACS. And the way that we defined this was they had to have at least two clinical troponins drawn, and those two troponins had to be drawn between 6 and 24 hours apart. And the reason for this is that we really wanted patients that the clinicians were concerned about um, in terms of having cardiac injury. We didn't want patients who, for instance, were young, had asthma, and had a troponin that was protocoled in the waiting room and never followed up on. So we excluded those patients who only had a single troponin drawn or who had multiple troponins drawn but were done less than six hours or greater than 24 hours apart. And our primary outcome is a 30-day composite outcome of MI revascularization or all-cause death. So KCD identified 1,261 patients during our three-month period. 628 of those patients were excluded, mostly because those patients either received a single troponin or had a serial troponin, but it didn't fit our time frame, and four patients didn't have any plasma available, so they were excluded. So that left us with 633 patients that were included. 
So we obtain the leftover plasma from the clinically drawn troponins from our clinical lab and stored it in aliquots at minus 80, and then subsequently submitted those to uh, the Singulex high-sensitivity troponin assay. And then we retrospectively obtained clinical data on all the patient characteristics, including their outcomes, on all the patients that were enrolled. So this table is showing us just the demographics of the patients that were enrolled in our study. Uh, 94 patients, or 15% of the total study population, met one of those cardiac outcomes within 30 days, and 71 patients, or 11%, had a myocardial infarction within 30 days. So as you can see, uh, for cardiac studies, the patient characteristics are pretty typical of what you would expect. And as you would expect, the patients who met the cardiac outcome or who had MI were more likely to be male a little bit older than the total study population and were more likely to have a known history of coronary artery disease. We also did kappa analysis uh, to look at interrelator reliability of our data extraction. And our kappa value was 0.86, so very good uh, reliability for the data extraction. So since we were doing these assays on leftover plasma from our clinical lab, we wanted to make sure that uh, our assays looked like they were performing very well. So these graphs are showing on the y-axis the high-sensitivity troponin assay values versus the clinical lab value on the x-axis. And to the left is looking at all values, and you can see that there's a very good correlation between the two assays with an R-squared value of 0.98. And then because of the high sensitivity of the Singulex assay, we wanted to make sure that patients who had very large elevations of troponin, so were having a very significant MI, that the assay was still performing well in that patient population. So on the right-hand side, you're looking at just the patients who had an initial troponin that was greater than 7,000 picograms per mil. And even in that patient uh, cohort, there was still very good correlation between the Singulex assay and the clinical assay with a R-squared value of 0.97. So this is showing the uh, receiver operating curves for the high-sensitivity troponin assay for both the outcome of myocardial infarction or the composite outcome. And in the table below that is showing the area under the curves for those outcomes for the uh, high-sensitivity assay as well as the clinical assay. So you can see the area under the curve for MI for the high sensitivity assay it was 0.95 compared to 0.92 for the clinical troponin. And for the composite outcome, the area under the curve was 0.85 for the high sensitivity troponin compared to 0.83. So very similar area under the curve, maybe slightly better for the troponin, uh, the high sensitivity troponin assay. Uh, what's a little more telling, though, is looking at the sensitivity specificity and positive and negative likelihood ratios uh, for these assays. So these are all looking at that initial blood that's drawn in the emergency department with the idea that potentially uh, we could use that as a way to rapidly rule out patients with this high sensitivity assay. So we defined negative for the high-sensitivity troponin assay as less than the 99th percentile value in uh, the human population based on previous studies. And then for our clinical lab troponin, we defined negative or completely normal as less than the level of detection that's able to be reported by our clinical lab. So for MI on the top, you can see the sensitivity of the high-sensitivity troponin assay was 0.93 compared to 0.86 for the clinical lab. Um, as expected, there's a little bit of reduction in specificity for the Singulex assay compared to the clinical lab because of its increased uh, sensitivity. And most importantly, with the likelihood ratios, the negative LR of 0.08 is very good for ruling out myocardial infarction. Uh, there's a similar relationship between the numbers for the composite outcome, as expected. It, uh, both assays don't perform as well for the composite outcome, which includes revascularization and death, as it is for uh, MI. So one of the things to think about is that these biomarker assays are really not done in isolation. It's really important to 
add in the risk stratification of individual patients in order to make clinical decisions. So we collected data on these patients um, by looking at their TIMI scores, the thrombolysis and myocardial infarction score. It's a commonly used uh, score to look at risk stratification for acute coronary syndromes um, in symptomatic patients. So in the score, patients get one point each for being older than 65 years old, having a combination of three or more cardiac risk factors, and that includes things like hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, being a current smoker, or having a family history of coronary disease. Um, they also receive a point if they have a known coronary disease themselves, uh, having two or more episodes of chest pain in 24 hours, aspirin use in the last seven days having ECG changes uh, that's defined as ST segment deviation, and then if there's an initial clinical troponin biomarker assay that's positive, they gain a point for that. So we really wanted to look at our low-risk cohort because the idea here is, is there a, um, a patient population where being low-risk as well as having a normal high sensitivity troponin assay, is, will that potentially uh, work well in terms of ruling out for acute coronary syndromes, especially MI? So this is looking at the receiver operating curves of the uh, high sensitivity troponin assay in our low risk population, and we define that as a TIMI of zero to two. And below that are the area under the curve showing an area under the, under the curve of 0.96 for MI and 0.81 for the composite outcome. Next, we're looking at sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative likelihood ratios for the assays only in that low-risk cohort. So in our group of the 633 patients, 358 of those patients fell into this TIMI of zero to two cohort. So in the subgroup analysis, the sensitivity for the uh, Singulex high sensitivity assay uh, for myocardial infarction was 0.94 compared to 0.71 for the clinical assay. So it looks like there's a little more of a separation between the two assays in the low-risk cohort compared to the total cohort. Um, again, there's a reduction in specificity for the Singulex assay as expected, although that uh, reduction in the low-risk group uh, seems to be a little bit less than in the uh, all-patient group. And then, importantly, the negative likelihood of ratio for the singular X high sensitivity troponin assay was 0 0.07 with a 95% confidence interval that reached zero. And again, the composite outcome data looks very similar to the MI data other than that, um, in general, the performance characteristics for both of those assays aren't quite as good in the composite outcome compared to MI. So I think it's really important uh, in these studies to look at who are the actual patients that would be missed if we were going to use a single initial troponin assay as well as risk stratification as a means to rule out acute coronary syndrome. So in our patient, um, 26 of the 358 patients met the composite outcome within 30 days. 11 of those would have been missed by our initial clinical troponin assay, and eight of those would have been missed by the high sensitivity troponin assay. Uh, when you look at each individual component of the composite outcome, for MI, 17 patients met the criteria of having MI within 30 days. Five of those would have been missed by our initial cl clinical troponin assay, and only one of those would have been missed by the high sensitivity troponin assay. And that was a patient who had SVT, who had rates in the 240s in the emergency department. So presumably that patient had ongoing ischemia, which led to enough of a uh, leak of troponin to be classified as MI at a later time. And then looking at revascularization, 13 patients had revascularization within 30 days. And um, it looks like the table is messed up a little bit here, but uh, for both the clinical troponin and the singulex troponin, five, the same five patients would have been missed by um, both of those assays. And those were patients primarily who had EKG changes. One had an anterior Wellens change who had their LAD stented. Uh, one was a patient that was a, enrolled in another clinical trial who had a coronary CT and was found to have two-vessel disease and went on to cabbage. Um, Another patient with lateral T-wave inversions who had an LAD lesion that was stented, and then two patients who had positive stress tests with LAD lesions that were stented. 
And then for the outcome of death, four patients met that criteria. Three of those would have been missed by the clinical troponin, and two of those would have been missed by the high-sensitivity troponin. One of those was a patient with metastatic lung cancer who was admitted days after their original presentation for chest pain, and they developed healthcare-associated pneumonia and were transferred to comfort care. And then the second patient, the patient who had an empyema as the cause of their chest pain who was septic and then transferred to comfort care. So the point of this is, um, First, to just characterize those patients that would be missed, but also to recognize that it looks like a lot of these patients have some other factor that would have clued us in clinically that they were at high risk for deterioration of one sort or another. So one of the major criticisms uh, for the idea of using high sensitivity troponin assays to rule out patients for acute coronary syndromes is the idea that patients in the emergency department who in general are higher risk than patients who are seen in the clinic and who are symptomatic, that a lot of those patients, a very high proportion, will actually have positive values, even though those are very small positive values, and that we'll end up admitting a, a lot of patients for further testing, even more so than we do now. Um, so just to look at how the characteristics of that in our study, we actually had normal troponin values, so less than the 99th percentile, were actually very common in the patient population that we enrolled, and those are patients uh, not just all comers with chest pain, but those in which physicians were concerned enough that they were pursuing serial biomarker testing to rule out MI. So in our group of the 633 patients, 489 of those, or 77% of the total study population, had completely normal um, high-sensitivity troponin value assays. So another way to think about this is if we had the ability to utilize an initial normal high-sensitivity troponin assay in combination with low-risk stratification, so a TEMI of 0 to 2, if that were enough for us to be able to say that these patients are very low risk, that um, 323 of our patients, so actually 51% of our total study population, could have potentially been eligible for either early stress testing or early discharge, which could have actually resulted in a very significant uh, reduction in both time in the emergency department, admission, and, uh, and cost to those patients in the healthcare system. So the conclusions of this are that the single extraponin assay uh, seemed to perform well in the population of the study and had a high sensitivity for myocardial infarction, more so than for the composite outcome. I think the strengths of the study are that because of the way we enrolled patients, we were able to get a consecutive sample of all patients within a three-month window. So I think our study population really represents the clinical reality of who we do these assays on. Um, we also didn't exclude patients who may have had a reason to have an elevated level of troponin besides uh, acute coronary ischemia. So we didn't exclude patients who had renal failure, for instance, or congestive heart failure. Um, we also didn't do any re-adjudication based on the high sensitivity troponin results. All of our uh, outcome data, is, especially for MI, is based on the clinical troponin assay. So if anything, we've skewed our, or biased our study a little bit toward the clinical troponin assay. And I think, to be fair, that was the best way for us to perform the study. The limitations of the study are that um, there was a retrospective um, way that we collected the clinical data and that included the outcomes and that we had a little bit lower event rate compared to some published studies. So our overall composite outcome event rate was 15%. Some other studies show event rates 20% um, or maybe even a little bit more. Um, and that may be because we enrolled everyone that we were concerned about ACS and we're doing serial biomarker testing. And some other studies have used unstable angina as an outcome and we didn't for this study. So just to acknowledge uh, the other participants in the study, Eva Moses and Seth Kendler are emergency medicine residents and helped with the data extraction. And Chris Carpenter is another faculty in emergency medicine who helped with our statistical analysis. And then all of our high sensitivity troponin assays were actually performed in the Washington University proteomics core by uh, Elizabeth Macy, and the core is head by Reed Townsend, who provide a lot of academic input. And then our funding sources are from the Emergency Medicine Foundation. Singulex provided a grant which helped to defer some of the costs of the uh, high sensitivity assay and then startup funds from my division. Back to you, John. 
Stacy, that was a clear and wonderfully specific demonstration of the application of a very promising assay in a clinical setting. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, before we proceed, let me remind everyone that our Q&A segment that comes right after the panelists have uh, made their presentations. Please type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our third panelist, Dr. Lynn Ziske has been waiting patiently in the wings, and I think he's ready to go. Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. The philosophy at Singulex is, is again, very much in concert with what Corinne and Stacy have, have alluded to, and what we're trying to do is ultimately get to disease management. But we start at the development of, of a life science tool and service, and, and basically that is basic research. And so what we're trying to do is ultimately uncover novel biomarkers that might be uh, specific to disease. But unlike a lot of companies, you know, what we're trying to accomplish is, is to go into a clinically relevant type of approach. And in our laboratories, in our at Singulex, we actually uh, try to apply some of these biomarkers that we're discovering or other people are discovering and put them into a clinical or CLIA-like laboratory setting and just test numbers of samples where we can actually start to prove, if you will, um, the val validity of that particular biomarker for that disease management. And long-term, if all of that is, is proves itself out, we're looking towards the, the end goal of disease management products or IVD products. So we're, as a company, we're very philosophically oriented to the whole process, not just the start of the process. And basically what we're trying to do in a high-definition immunoassay system is to be able to look at all samples. We want to quantify all samples, not only disease, but healthy. And as Stacy and Corinne have pointed out, you know, some technologies are unable to actually measure the healthy state of things. And basically, disease is ultimately differential biology. You're looking at the difference between where a normal healthy uh, basal levels are versus an elevated or depressed level, depending on what you're accomplishing. If it's a drug treatment, it could be a depression of, the, of a particular uh, analyte. So what we're trying to do is, is basically get earlier disease and effective monitoring. Um, so we're looking at not so much of the acute level, but rather than the chronic level. So what we've done and accomplished is basically trying to increase and decrease the, the uh, lower limit of quantification. And what we're trying to accomplish ultimately is to decrease the background and increase the signal of any given uh, sample that comes into play. And we do that with a couple of things. One is we have modified the immunoassay process, which is the top part of the left-hand corner. Uh, and what we're doing is using a magnetic bead. Unlike the Luminex or the multiplex approach, we're actually just using that bead as a surface. And I'll go into that in just a little bit. And the other part of it is, is we actually have improved the technology of detection as well. So. The ultimate goal of any immuno, immuno assay is to lower the quantification, and that, that's the approach we're taking. So initially, our first approach is to do what every immuno assay does out there in the big wide world, which is we're trying to form a sandwich. And the first steps of our process are no different than anyone else uh, and any other immun immunoassay approach. We have to capture the beads, we have to wash the beads, we have to put the detection antibody on, uh, or a detector, if you will. And what we do that's unique in the last step here is rather than rely on multiple combinations, our sandwich is the purest form of a sandwich, if you will. We capture with a capture antibody. We have a primary interaction with the analyte. And unlike many protocols, we actually have a direct interaction with the analyte from a second epitope with the detection antibody, which is has a an Alexa fluor uh, covalently bound to that particular antibody. So it's minimum of chemistry steps rather than having multiple reactions and multiple chemistry, which is ultimately loses sensitivity. The more processes you do, the more things can go wrong. The thing that's very unique to the Singulex system is our last step, 
and why I said the bead is merely a surface for us is actually the last step is an elution step. So we dissociate that sandwich and ultimately only read the supernatant that is in the elution buffer, and that only contains detection buffer, detection analyte, antibody and analyte. And the analyte, it doesn't have the fluorescence. And then ultimately it goes into our reader, which then measures the amount of fluorescence that comes across. And simply enough, we take traditional technology, and you can look here, um, a classic horseradish peroxidase acid from R&D systems. It's got great, this, in this case, it's VEGF. Um, we're using the same antibodies, the same analyte. Everything is harmonized here. And so it has a great lower limit of quantification for that particular assay at 10 picograms per mil. Unfortunately, you need to have better sensitivity for some a lot of assays, and therefore we can apply our, our technology by just doing a plate-based capture, which is also available on our, our instrument. You can plate-based capture, do the um, elution profile, and then ultimately you can increase your sensitivity about an order of magnitude. If you go finally to the microparticles, now we can really uh, increase the sensitivity. And, and as Corinne pointed out, we can roughly get three orders of magnitude over a, a, an ELISA, a standard horseradish peroxidase ELISA. So we do improve the technology, but it's a matter of, of physics, if you will. We're not reinventing immunoassays. We're just improving them. If you want to think of it, we're taking a Volkswagen and make a Maserati out of it. It's kind of a good description of it. So once now that we have the technology, what can we really do? And this is the, the steps that we really believe are bringing a, a biomarker to, to the clinic. And the questions we ask are, are is it disease specific? So many markers out there can be, you know, universal, if you will, put quotes around universal, uh, in that they can be differential in, in a particular disease, but they're differential in all diseases. So therefore, you know, they're not very useful as a biomarker that's specific to a particular problem. You must be able to measure it in healthy states so we can so that we can distinguish it. And again, we're trying to quantify. We have to measure these things, not just detect them. Um, does it have low biological variability? Well, why is that important? Well, if you're going to go on a monitoring program, cardiac troponin or IL-17A or uh, TNF-alpha, all of which have been mentioned throughout this, this seminar today, um, you want to be able to see, as long as there's low variability, if there is a change, it's meaningful. If, if, the, if the variability is, is relatively high and over a day or diurnal cycle or something of that nature, then that really doesn't help you in, in trying to monitor patients and, and ultimately be able to, to work with their diseases. Does it predict future disease? These are now becoming extremely important, these last three questions, which is, can you predict disease? Can you do something about it? And then if you do something about it, does it lower and predict better clinical outcome? They're extremely important. So those are the questions we go. So let's take a, a little trip back in history and go back to 2005. And this is before, and a little, we probably reversed this uh, seminar in that Stacy's already told you how good the, the cardiac troponin I is actually for a marker. But back in 2005, we knew that it was specific to cardi cardi cardiomyocytes, damage to cardiomyocytes, and it was the gold standard, and still is, uh, for do, uh, diagnosing acute myocardial infarction. The only thing was, because of the technology that existed out in the days, is they thought cardiac troponin I was only released during ischemic heart damage and was not present in healthy people. Um, so therefore, <laughs> th that was ultimately a problem. Now, Singulex created the high sensitivity assay, and I don't need to, to go into that very far because Stacy has elegantly put it uh, in her previous talk. But one of the things that I want to point out here in this particular slide is, uh, and Stacy was working in the acute setting, 
and the technologies that are out there, the Siemens, the Roches, the Beckmans, they all have good sensitive approaches and they keep driving them down. But one of the things what we want to do for the next generation is to be able to look at this from a chronic standpoint. So it's not just the first reading so that when a patient comes into the ER, as in Stacy's department, we've already given her all of these values all along, and all of a sudden she sees something that was five, 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 six, seven, whatever, and now it goes up to eight or nine or even ten. She already has that information, which is extremely powerful in in helping her go into her diagnosis and and be able to to address all of the various things. So, what we're trying to do here is actually look at the various. Um, uh, levels at the low levels. So let's go back to our questions. And the first thing is, is so obviously it's uh, disease specific, and now it's measurable in healthy state, as she pointed out. This is numerous studies, not just Fred Apple, but Alan Wu and John Todd here at Singulex, and there's more than that. Uh, and everyone's kind of come up with the uh, the cutoff of approximately 9 to 10, um, depending on who you're talking to and what publication. But it's right at that 10 picogram per mil area. So it's definitely detectable. Now, Alan Wu has been spending about the last four or five years trying to look at biological variability, and he's seen that these are extremely low variability on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. So that really helps in allowing us to be able to monitor people. And so the cardiologists around the country are now starting to, to buy into the Singulex test here in our CLIA laboratory and starting to monitor patients and seeing if there's an increase, decrease, uh, particularly if somebody has a has presented themselves with a fairly high cardiac troponin I level, can we do something with medicines and or lifestyle to ultimately bring that back in into line where it needs to be? And so the, the next question comes down to, is it predictive for future disease? And so these particular patients in the Minnesota Heart Study, and I believe there's about 4,500 participants of over 15 years, so this is a retrospective study, and these are people that have not had any cardiac in incidence events at all, so a primary prevention. And does it is it predictive? So less than that 10 picograms per mil, the odds ratio is approximately one. And if you look at the, if it's greater than 10 picograms per mil or that 99% cutoff, it's an eight, almost a 10 or 10 per, tenfold increase risk of having a your first heart attack or her first cardiac event. So that's disconcerting. The second thing is, is uh, Tommy Wang at, was at Mass General, who's now at Vanderbilt University, uh, did a study, and he wanted to stratify patients even further. And if you look at this subclassification, even a change in one, approximately a picogram per mil of cardiac troponin I becomes very dramatic uh, over time. So and this is involved in the Framingham Heart Study, another roughly 4,500 patients or so. Uh, so it's becoming a clear indicator over time and that this is a great way to monitor the ability to assess potential primary uh, intervention. So now if you go on to somebody who's already had an event, and is it predictive of a secondary? So would there be a secondary event or a second event that's approaching? And this is the Timmy 22 Prove-It study with David Morrill. And again, he initially began the, the stratification of, of patients, and he was doing the same kind of thing, not quite as, as, as strong as Tommy was doing, but again, the same type of approach. And if you go on and then now look at the uh, difference between Pravacol, which is basically a moderate statin, and Lipitor with a more aggressive statin, the Lipitor is delivered at 80 milligrams, where the Pravacol is delivered at 40 milligrams. And so in this case, you can see that when the cardiac troponin levels are less than 9 picograms per mil. Uh, you can see that there's very little difference between an aggressive versus a moderate statin. However, if the cardiac troponin I levels are greater than 9 picograms per mil, you see that an aggressive statin is far more productive in predicting and being a, a able to maintain and keep the levels at 
pretty much where it is when it's below 9 picograms per mil. So definitely when you have this as a marker, you can also predict how aggressive you really want to get in your therapy and therapeutic uh, intervention. So we've basically gotten to the point now, we've answered all our questions. Is it disease specific? Yes. Is it measurable in healthy states? Yes. Does it show low biological variability? Yes. And the predictability of future disease, so it's met every one of our criteria, including actionable and being able to predict better clinical outcomes. So, like any marker, and you don't really want to rely on a particularly one marker uh, to, to ultimately do your um, diagnosis and, and ultimately therapy. So looking at, and this is very preliminary information, looking at IL-6 and TNF-alpha and the various uh, phases and elements of um, cardiovascular disease, you can see that IL-6 looks like it could be predictive and being useful as a tool, and also uh, TNF-alpha. And just real quickly, you can look at the next slide, and this is, as I said, very preliminary work, and we also then have to take each one of these cytokines and go through those seven questions all over again. But it looks like it might be worth investigating. So if you look at the um, various markers by themselves, um, they, they, they looks like they have an increased heart factor risk and if you double the concentration. But more importantly, and this is kind of this, this wrapping up of idea of not only cardiac troponin I, but IL-6 and now starting to put in other additional markers. Now, if you look at just one marker, it's about 45%. But if you look at two, it's 240. Look at three, it's 320. What happens when you go to four? Um, so you get that kind of idea that this is really kind of an intriguing uh, way to start to really put in more biomarkers that can have a much more predictive and powerful value. And again, this is all about looking and managing chronic disease and being able to assist in the various measures. So in conclusion, we're looking at precision. Um, obviously, you have to have a very precise and analytical tool in order to do this. And ultimately, we're looking at all the various things with low biological variability. You want to be able to stratify the disease and drug states. That's extremely important, and being able to have that accuracy and precision is ultimately where you need to have this kind of uh, technology. And ultimately, you can monitor the response to therapy and being able to be clinically relevant. So with that, um, I think I've acknowledged most of the people along the way, and uh, except our Singulex team here in our CLIA laboratory, as well as my R&D staff. So with that, I thank you, and I turn it back to you, John. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Corrine and Stacy. You've all done a great job showing how biomarkers can provide highly informative medical data that can play a critical role in a clinical setting. Thank you so, so much. We've had a number of excellent questions sent in by the audience for our panel for the Q&A session. But before we begin, I'd like to ask you to disable your pop-up blockers because a short survey on this webinar will be appearing soon. We would very much appreciate your feedback on this webinar and your thoughts as well, which will help us to continue to bring you topical and timely webinars in the future. Thank you. Okay, let's take the first question from our audience, and it's for Lynn. I'm a user of more traditional immunoassay technology and want to understand how exactly your technology gains sensitivity over what I am currently using. Lynn? Okay. Um, briefly, um, wh what we do is we use beads as a surface, and, it's, and we do that in, in the suspension, and that minimizes any potential nonspecific binding because in most cases, nonspecific binding is onto the plastics of the wells. And what that allows us to do to, is to wash much more effectively with our uh, procedures and our protocols using the magnetic bead. We actually do not get any residual wash buffer left over in, in between washes. And so we get a very effective wash, again, minimizing background. The elution uh, step itself is actually done after a transfer into a very fresh plate. So when we do 
elute the sandwich from uh, the bead, the only thing that actually gets released is the uh, detection antibody and the analyte in, in a very uh, pure buffer. There's no other things that could get released because it isn't a fresh plate. And then finally, what we ultimately do is we have that concentrated, and when we're um, into the reader, we're actually not necessarily counting light per se. We're actually counting events. And so it's not a matter, we don't have to worry about light scatter and all the other things that come into play. So we can really get a, a really solid concentration on that signal. And thus, the, all of those things combined actually improve the overall sensitivity, uh, depending on if you're from a plate-based or other bead-based technology. Okay, Lynn, we have another question for you. Uh, this webinar offered information on cardiovascular and inflammatory diseases. What other application areas can your technology address? Well, really we can address any immunoassays um, uh, disease areas. Uh, I, we have neuromarkers, the A beta 40 and 42, and a lot. Of, we've recently had some publications even on the A beta oligomers uh, using some proprietary work with other companies. Um, we also have metabolic markers such as GLP-1, active and total. And most recently, we've been looking into the toxicity world um, and into the kidney injury panel, and we have markers uh, involved in that. And again, it, could, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bead-based assay. It can be a plate-based assay. And so we have the flexibility of working pretty much with, uh, across the board. And finally, if, if, if somebody really needs to have uh, something that's not necessarily offered by our current menu, is we have a custom services where we can either work with them and develop assays here at Singulex, or we can teach them how to do it themselves. So there's a f whole variety of things and, and natures to, to work with. Okay, and we have a little time for one. This next question go out to the entire panel. We have enough time for one of the panel members to answer this. So um, the question is, can we employ multiplex immunoassay and discovery work and use a different single analyte immunoassay to validate assays? Uh, who would like to answer that? Um, this is Corinne Solier. Maybe I can uh, bring a perspective uh, uh, on that question. Um, I think it is uh, absolutely possible. It's uh, very much uh, reflecting the current, uh, the current view on multiplex immunoassays so that it's a flexible platform offering option to measure multiple candidate biomarkers where you have a, a variable level of confidence on and when you are more, uh, let's say, informed on the validated uh, uh, state of uh, these biomarkers, you would like to use a more, um, uh, let's, say, let's say, more robust assay and then you would like to move to another more robust platform. Um, like uh, Singleplex uh, uh, ELISA or Singulex or other platforms that offer um, robust features. Uh, by doing so, however, you have the risk uh, to um, switch to different antibodies, uh, to platforms using different antibodies. And also, um, we, we, we know uh, by experience that Multiplex platform have some uh, specificity issues. So if you, you're not too confident on how the panel was validated, you may end up in uh, pursuing biomarkers that may be false positives or that you would have missed because of sensitivity issues in the multiplex panel. Um, so we definitely need as well more robust technologies, even for discovery, uh, that would uh, help alleviate these issues. Thank you. Stacey, you have about a minute. Do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I think the idea of using multiplex uh, assays in, in general in order to kind of identify your main target is uh, really a good way to kind of cast a broad net, but then as the question is mentioning, you're really going to have to confirm those, uh, that data with looking at like a single analyte assay, definitely. Well, as I said, unfortunately, we've run out of time. This has been an excellent webinar. These presentations have been uh, really to the point very informative, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. 
If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends. Again, a big thanks to the panel for outstanding presentations, and also want to say thank you to our audience for your attention and for your thoughtful questions about various topics brought up during the webinar. And thank you to our sponsor, Singulex, who made this event possible. Bye for now.